some folks might know us from some of our higher level partnerships like Lizzo, and that's great and sexy, but day in, day out, we obviously cannot sustain and, and have budgets just for that. We work with tons of creators from all sizes and all backgrounds. But I think the most important thing is that the process of working with creators, regardless if they're the high tier celebrity talent or they're someone that's just starting their journey is really the same. And that work starts both internally and externally. Internally, like everything that we do obviously stems from a purpose and a goal. And so for a lot of things that you mentioned in the beginning, like that's really around the brand. But we have the same sort of goals and mission when it comes to product as well. Explore the minds and marketing strategies behind today's winning brands and businesses. Tap into the power of the creator economy with Earned by Creator IQ. Here's Connor Begley. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Earned. I've got David Naiman on the show today, the global lead of talent and content at Logitech. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks, Connor. Happy to be here. And we had quite the time scheduling this. So I am glad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I canceled a few times. You may, you may have canceled once or twice. It was a show. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're in a Q3 or Q4, depending on, on how you look at it. So I think just the fact that we've been able to do this is is already a tick. So, you know, happy, happy we're able to make it work. Yeah, 100%. Well, let's hop in. I mean, as I dove into the approach that Logitech has taken kind of over the years, particularly during the time that you've been there, it's really quite fascinating. Because I think you think of it as a technology product, but you guys have done all kinds of stuff with entertainment, celebrities, music, etc. How do you guys think about that organizationally? Because you've got your product, and of course your product is integrated into some of that, but a lot of it, it isn't. How do you guys think about that in terms of the way that you work with talent? Yeah, so I appreciate that you've, you've recognized that. I think it's definitely, we've been a little bit of, you know, kind of a little bit of everything and all intentional, obviously. So I think it all starts at the brand level first and foremost. So when I first joined Logitech a couple of years ago, there was definitely a pretty significant focus on, you know, what is our brand? What does it represent? And then how do we build some of that sort of cultural cachet or that cultural connection with the brand and, and consumers. And so one of the best ways I think that we all know how to do that is through talent and creators and, and building partnerships that are authentic, engaging, and obviously achieve sort of the, the goals that you have in mind. So for us and, and myself as, as part of my role, that, that's definitely been first and foremost, a huge priority. So, you know, regardless of size, we typically look at partnerships. These are not vendors. These are true partnerships. And so the process is always the same. So some folks might know us from some of our higher level partnerships like Alizo, and that's great and sexy, but, you know, day in, day out, we obviously cannot just sustain and, and have budgets just for that. You know, we work with tons of creators from all sizes and all backgrounds. But I think the most important thing is that the process of working with creators, regardless if they're the high tier, you know, celebrity talent, or there's someone that's just starting their journey is, is really the same. And that work starts both internally and externally. Internally, like everything that we do obviously stems from a purpose and a goal. And so for a lot of things that you mentioned in the beginning, like that's really around the brand. But we have the same sort of goals and mission when it comes to product as well. So first and foremost, we understand, we try to identify kind of what the goal is and, and what are we trying to achieve. And then that starts the first thing. And the next thing we try to do is try to figure out, all right, now that we know what that is, like how do we extend that and expand that into a talent and creator strategy? You know, who are the creators that we want to work with? What are the types of creators that we want to work with? And really have a vision for what we want that partnership to be. One of the things that I like to do sort of before we even start outreach or before we even get to that conversational point is sort of sketch out and have a vision of what an ideal partnership could look like. You know, best case, you've nailed it. Worst case, you have sort of a starting point when it comes to those conversations with creators or talent. And then, you know, move on, obviously, once you've sort of identified all that and you feel good about where you are, you start those conversations. And I think the most important thing for us, and I think for anybody probably listening, is just make sure that you're communicating clearly what your goals are, what your intentions for the partnership are, and make sure that the talent and the partner is also aligned. It's not always going to be the case. So I think you have to sometimes recognize that it's, you know, the worst, the last place you want to be is try to identify a partner and activate a partnership that isn't necessarily checking all the boxes and make sure that you're completely aligned. And that goes obviously to internal conversations as well. I think sometimes folks believe or can think that creators or talent are a silver bullet and they can, you know, you just align on a partnership and they create content or you leverage their brand or their name and, you know, it can sort of unlock a lot of value. But I don't think that's necessarily always the case or normally is the case. So you really need to be aligned internally on what you want from this partnership and make sure that all elements internally are, are on the same page. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating to think about the leap from, say, like Lizzo to an electronics manufacturer, right? And I think in a lot of ways, if I, like, as I sit here and reflect, like, I have, you know, a Logitech mouse, right? right? Like, it works. (laughs) <laughs> but it's interesting to really reflect on where the brand sits in my mind, which is that it's kind of a lifestyle brand in some ways. Like, whereas I think a lot of the other electronics that I have, whether it's like I look at my monitor or my keyboard, it's like it feels commodity, right? And I think in some ways, the way that you guys talk about it, this idea of like, this exists to connect you with the digital experiences that are part of your life, whether that's listening to Lizzo or playing a game or doing whatever. It's just fascinating that you guys have been able to kind of cross that bridge or make that connection in a way that resonates with me personally and I would imagine with a lot of other people. First of all, thank you. So I guess we were somewhat successful. um, Yeah. At least. But, you know, I I would agree with that. I think we sort of are at the intersection of lifestyle, but there's a lot of, you know, things that we do and a lot of our product line that goes beyond that as well. Like we've got products that are for creators, but they might be a developer or software engineer. So like that requires a whole different type of approach, strategy, type of customer that you're speaking to. And then ultimately the, then the type of creator that you are working with, that you are trying to reach that customer. So it's, for me, it was actually, you know, sort of a, interesting challenge when, you know, I first joined and the first part of the focus and priority was really on the brand level. And then as we started going a little bit deeper and going and thinking more about not just brand marketing, but product marketing on the outside, you would think, oh, a keyboard's a keyboard. You know, everybody needs a keyboard. You do, hopefully, but the intention and the purpose of that specific keyboard is going to be different from customer to customer. And so for us, we have five or six different types of keyboards. You know, you have mechanical, you have ergo, you have ones for Mac. And so once you start diving in deeper, then you realize, all right, each of those has a different audience, has a different mm. sort of price point, has a different sort of customer and how you engage with them and how you reach them. And ultimately, the partnerships that you activate in order to do so are quite different. But at the core, then you kind of like hit the nail on the head. Like that's from a storytelling and a messaging standpoint, that's what we're trying to do at the heart of it. At the heart of it is like this product allows you to do the thing that you do at a very high level. So if you are a coder or developer, this keyboard allows you to do that. So how do you tell that story? If you are a creator and your webcam, like this webcam allows you to then do the thing that you love to do the most and do it at a high level. And so I think it's finding that balance between like, yes, trying to, obviously we have a product to talk about, we have messaging, we have guidelines, but at the end of the day, like we also want to sort of have that emotional element to it as well to really inspire hopefully that purchase intent that happens. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting again, thinking through like, okay, I mean, I'm on an Apple laptop, right? And if you were to think about the way that Apple has positioned themselves over the years, it's about culture, it's about creators, creative, talent, et cetera, music. It's funny, I don't know. I had always thought of it as being more of a commodity space, but it ends up being very much a lifestyle space. So let's talk a little bit about that process. So you've got different constituencies you're trying to communicate with that obviously align with different product lines that you're ultimately selling. What's that evaluation process and sourcing process look like? How do you end up deciding that, yep, you know, Lizzo is the right person or Roblox is the right area to invest in? Like, how do you make that call? What does that process look like? Yeah, I mean, we just throw stuff against the wall and see if it sticks. (laughs) And I wish it was that easy. I know, I think it, while sort of that process, whether working with talent or finding the right platform distribution for the right program, Obviously, they look different on the outside. You know, they're completely different types of approaches. From the inside, I think we still ask the same questions and we still go through the same process. And I think the first part is probably not a surprise to you or anybody probably listening. It's we look at the data and follow, you know, go and see where the data leads. For somebody like a Lizzo or a talent partner, we would look at does their audience correspond with our audience? You know, does their promotional or marketing cycle reflect sort of what were our trajectory and our timeline as well. So I think that's the first thing you sort of identify, like, is there, there, there to at least yep. start? And so, you know, there's a lot of tools and there's a lot of analytics, maybe more than ever before. And sometimes it feels a little overwhelming, but it's a good thing. I'm, I'm happy yep. to have it. So that's the data part of it. And then I think there's the other part of it is the art and the subjectivity, because then you kind of, and that's why I also don't think like, Hopefully, we won't be fully replaced by AI (laughs) because there is, I think, a little bit of an art form, although I did just see the Gemini YouTube, Gemini Google video and that sort of 
scared me a little bit, but in an exciting way. You look at the art, you know, you want to make sure that from a brand standpoint, their values and their mission aligns with yours. You start to look at the quality of the content or the output that they have in the past. Does that align with what you're envisioning and what you feel is best reflective of the brand? So it's really this balance between data and art, and then you try to make the best decisions that you can. And I think regardless of their transformational partnership, like some of these bigger creators and talent that we worked with, or maybe what can seem on the surface more transactional, which is what we do maybe a little bit more on the daily, whether it's your seated partners or your, your one-off paid partners, or even your sort of short-term brand ambassador partners, you're really looking, you're going through that same process and you're really making sure that there's alignment across the board. But I haven't seen the Gemini video. What what happened today? This Sorry. was a couple of days ago. I don't know when this is airing, but it was. It's really just amazing to see. Like it's short, six minute video that kind of showcases the power of the. I'm probably not the best person to speak to, but it's, yeah, it, yeah, really, yeah. it recognizes images, it recognizes drawings, it, it recognizes the voice in that process in just a way that I'm sure things like this have existed. It kind of just. I looked at it and I was just like, you know, somebody who casually sort of observing this. Also, it's like whoa. The one I, <laughs> Yeah. And with one eye towards like, do I need to like, you know, change careers at some point? This is coming behind me. But uh, no, it's just really fascinating. I'm just, I'm very excited about all of these things. I think there's a world which all of this is actually, it's for good. And it really helps us do what we do in a bigger and better way. Yeah. Have you seen Pika? It's crazy. Like that's the one where so. you can say, create a video, which is obviously the next iteration of create a photo, but create a video of, you know, an astronaut eating a peanut butter and jelly, doing whatever. And it will create a full-fledged, fully animated video. And, and you can say, make it in this style, that style, and it will do it. Or you can take an existing photo and say, animate this photo, have it do whatever. It'll take the photo, turn it into an animated photo, have it go. It is crazy. Like it's yeah, bananas. I, I, that's amazing. And like I, as somebody who's just generally excited by like technology and advancement, I think amazing, great. But then there is that voice in the back of your head that's like, oh, wait, like today it's drawing a duck. <laughs> what are you doing, you know, three years from now? That's the part that gives me a little bit pause, but I'm just, that's just my mindset sometimes. So yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing. I think it gets really weird. Where it gets really weird is about 20 years from now, 15 years from now. At that point, you know, it'll be essentially about a billion times smarter than a human is, is kind of what the forecast is. And like, that's where it's like, I don't really know what's going to happen at that point. But yeah. again, we can leave that for another podcast. So let's get back to the influencer stuff. So you, know, you said, okay, so you've got this process, you've got the data, you've got the kind of soft kind of touch, right? Like, does this feel right? Is this in line, et cetera? I'm curious yeah. if, you know, obviously Logitech's a very large organization, right? And I think most kind of smaller brands can kind of, you know, operate a bit more quickly. There's not as many approvals and that kind of stuff. I'm curious if the idea of like brand safety and basically getting more checks off than you had to in the past, has that risen recently? Because I feel like there's been a number of you know, times where it didn't work out for brands? Or, or is that pretty much the same as it has been? Yeah, you know, obviously I can't speak for every brand. I think for us, I can't say there's been a, a substantial change just because I think our process has really been pretty tight throughout. Yeah. I think it's something that we've worked with even since I've been here since day one with legal and with other stakeholders to make sure that, you know, there's a comfort level, there's an understanding. I think we obviously don't just execute partnerships internally. We work with agency partners during that onboarding process, we are sort of, we're, you know, very commu overly communicative, maybe to a certain degree about those things. So I think for us, it, it's sort of business as usual, but business as yep. usual, really a high standard. But I understand why and how, you know, other brands and like, it's, it's a very important part of the process. I think, you know, we, when you work with speaking of AI and computers and technology and robots, like that is not working with creators. It's not working talent. Yeah. You're working with partners and humans. And so you need to understand that and you need to understand where your brand is willing to go. There's certainly times where there have been creators or talent that have you know expressed a, an interest and a desire to work with us. And while we appreciate that and love that they love the product, they are not necessarily the best representative of the brand. So you just have to understand that. You have to understand sort of like where your red lines are and kind of how you engage around that and what your process is. And, and for us, it's really... It's a collaborative process internally. It's, you know, there's multiple stakeholders. We do try to remove as much, say, subjectivity as possible because you don't want to necessarily get to a point where, like, you don't want to work with someone because this person is not a fan of something they might have done. Like, you're really trying to yeah. stick to the facts, stick to the legal sort of scope of things. But for us, it's really always been, you know, front and center and one of the first check marks as we look to navigate a partnership. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So now that you're closing in on close to three years, right? Well, you're past the two and a half year mark. So now you've got some stuff under your belt. I'm curious, you know, over that time, are there any particular initiatives that you think like, we killed it? Like, this is something that went really well. And like, what was that? And then I think secondarily, is there any that you're like, hmm, thought this was going to work, didn't work, and maybe why? And you don't have to get into the specifics if you don't want yeah. to. But let's start with the second one first, just because let's get the like the middle <laughs> way. And there's not a specific example that comes to mind. I think one of the things that has sort of transpired over the last couple of years, you know, thanks for looking at my LinkedIn. Your anniversary, I expect like a little congratulations. Is that in the beginning, and this made this made sense. Like it was a, a lot about and our investment and our strategy and our approach was about brand awareness and affinity. And when you think about that and like along the funnel, that's really upper funnel. That's really trying to reach as many people as possible in as many different places and with as many different touch points as possible. And so, you know, that was really great. And like, I think it made a big impact on the brand. But over the years, I think some of that transition or some of that focus has sort of transitioned to more, how do we take these amazing partners who have great reach and, you know, really allow you to do some really great things and have their own production and creative and content prowess and, you know, these engaged communities. But how do you sort of like move them you know, further into the funnel and or mid and lower funnel and really get more sort of performance value out of that mm-hmm. investment as well. And so I think that's kind of where we are right now as well. You know, there's a balance. Not everything can be sort of conversion and focus and you, you needed a little bit of both. But I, I would say certainly just being candid, there is definitely a challenge of identifying the right creators and who are obviously doing what they do best and having, you know, the engagement's there and the content is great and you're hopefully leveraging it in in ways that go beyond just organic social. But conversion, which is potentially a metric or a KPI, isn't there. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, that's really been something that we look at a lot and is, is a constant like refinement. So, you know, the data is there. Hey, you know, this creator has great engagement and they have a big audience. And so you can sort of extrapolate from there, like, oh, they should be able to convert their software developer or their, you know, their lifestyle creator. And this is a, a pink keyboard and mouse that this should be close to a no-brainer if if those exist in influencer marketing. But when it comes time to activation and the content is out in the world, that piece isn't there. And so I think we're constantly looking to how to improve that, how to identify that. And I think the road to conversion is, is long and hard. And I think it's just about continuing to test and refine and identify the creators that do allow you to do that and then sort of build that partnership with them from there. So it goes beyond just a transaction or one-off and, and, and there's more value there. Yeah, I think the long-term relationships are definitely something we observe. Like it's like once you find those people that are, you know, good at all areas or at least very good at one or the other in terms of awareness versus conversion, you know, lean into those partners, right? Like once you find them, lean in. Is that something, would you say that most of your stuff is like one off or is it something where once you find somebody that works, you're like, let's keep working with this person now? Yeah, I think it's it's a hybrid. So I think we're constantly looking for those people that obviously perform. And when you find them, you know, hug them close and keep them tight and just make sure they're, they're as happy as possible. And, and I think the reason it works is, and it is because that's what you've hopefully unlocked is like the holy grail. You've created great content. You found a great audience that resonates with what you're creating and what that creator has sort of communicated through that content and through their assets or through their relationship with their audience. And then a light bulb kind of went off like, hey, you know, not only great for this person, but it can be great for me as well. And I want to then go and convert. So I think that's what we're all searching for is like that intersection of like great engagement and great community and also the ability to then inspire and influence purchase intent. So yeah, constantly, you know, constantly on the lookout corner if you you know that person happy to happy to kind of test the partnership as well yeah totally so i know that you guys did some really interesting stuff around kind of roblox you've kind of dabbled in the vet metaverse quite a bit you know with roblox at the song breaker awards i'm curious is that something that you expect to continue to invest in obviously on the topic of technology i think there's been a lot of it kind of went crazy, then slowed down, and now it's coming back a little bit. Talk to me about that a little bit. The metaverse, gaming, like how you're thinking about all that stuff. Yeah, so Songbreaker Awards is actually really interesting because it wasn't built for Roblox to begin with. So yeah. um, Roblox was actually year two of the activation. The program, mm. just back a bit, was initially intended to celebrate and honor creators who were making a giant impact on culture, but weren't necessarily getting the credit 
and recognition they deserve. So if you think back to 2020, when all these dances were going viral on TikTok and influencing the pop charts and actually making sort of like real contributions to culture and also artists bottom line, the actual creators that were creating these trends, they were sort of forgotten or maybe their trends were co-opted to a point where nobody really knew where that trend sort of started from. There's that famous example of like, I think it was, I don't, I don't want to speak, so I'm not going to name the creator, but a creator went on yeah. Jimmy Fallon, recreated a bunch of dances, and there was a little blowback because none of the dancers were represented there. And a lot of those dancers mm. were by Mark creators who actually were the ones that sort of started that trend. So we saw that. We're like, this is not great. This is not okay. Something needs to be done. And again, going back to like our mission and values of creator rights and supporting creators in a way that elevates and inspires them, we decided that like there's a there there. And so the team initially, in partnership with Billboard, developed a chart called the Songbreaker chart, which actually mm-hmm. now is, I think, evolved into the TikTok Billboard chart. We'll, we'll take a little credit for it, I guess. And then <laughs> we decided, how do we take this offline? Or how do, what, how do we kind of grow this program and really sort of grow the awareness, really try to, again, do everything we can to recognize these creators? So we developed a format, kind of a traditional award show format, and threw it up on TikTok. Which in hindsight, which, you know, in the moment, you're like, great, we're honoring TikTok creators, award show, TikTok, boom, perfect synergy, it makes sense. Come to find out that people don't go on TikTok to watch long-term content or <laughs> award shows that are, you know, that feel very traditional. Like, it could be fun and it could be cool. Like, they'll maybe tune in here and there, but like, it's not the right, it might be the right context, but not the right format and not the right execution on the wrong platform. So we did it, it went well, but like we took a lot of learnings. And one of the learnings was if we were going to bring this to life, like how do we find a platform that will engage with this and feel a little bit more native? The world does not need another award show. Like there's already enough. <laughs> like how do we do this in a way that feels fresh and feels interesting? And so that's really where the conversation and the Roblox dynamic really came in. We looked at other sort of um, traditional platforms. We looked at do we go and build our own, our own metaverse and own something completely or do we go and kind of fish where the fish are and go somewhere where maybe there's a little less ownership, maybe there's a little more structure. You know, you can't do everything that you really want to do, but like you're already sort of participating in an established ecosystem. And so for Roblox, this was in 2021-ish where, you know, at first I was like, oh, Roblox, like, isn't that like a much younger platform? I don't necessarily know if we're at the line to sort of our core audience, but, you know, the more we discovered about it. I think this is also around time that they were also making a concerted effort to kind of grow and expand their audience, and their footprint and bring in bigger creators and talent that go beyond just what you sort of understood them to be. And it felt like it made sense. We were able to still take the heart and soul of what Songbreakers was about, which is recognizing creators. Fortunately, these creators are also have an audience and that reflective of the Roblox audience as well and build something that felt native to that platform. It wasn't just like a stuffy award show with creators coming in or out. We created avatars for everyone that we honored. We had a cool performance from Gail and Lizzo as Roblox characters. And then we integrated the brand in a really fun way. And this was like, I think the first time in my experience here where we were able to like take the products and do something with it that didn't feel like as the way that they were intended. So we had our ultimate ears earbuds as sort of like jet skis. We had more, it was like trampolines. So like really made sure that we did something, created something that was organic and native and would be receptive to an existing Roblox community. And it went really well. We I think we did almost 7 million visits in three days. We did almost 2 billion or media impressions, 147 countries. You know, people were in the chat, like saying, love watch it. Like things that maybe don't happen to us on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Um, but like kind of organically came up just because you created an experience and it wasn't meant to be transactional. It was meant to be an experience where the brand can show up, can celebrate, can find ways to live in that world in a way that makes sense without having to sort of like own an entire ecosystem. So that's Songbreaker and we were, we were really excited by, by what happened. And to your question of like, what's next or the metaverse, I think, I hope so. But I think what we will continue to do is really what this experience really allowed us to do or really what it represented, which is to continue to innovate and think outside the box and try to find, you know, new ways to continue to grow our footprint, continue to reach audiences in, in different places and places that they're excited about and they're engaging with outside of maybe our nine to five, if you will, which is, you know, TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, et cetera. The other area that was a really interesting to me from the outside was the Own the Eight Count film. And it's not, again, not common that you see brands co-creating like feature length films were you involved in that at all? What was the inspiration behind that? Did you guys consider that a success? If so, why? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, luckily for you in this podcast, I was involved in that, so I can definitely <laughs> speak to it. Yeah, that was a really probably my my favorite program to date that we've worked on. And the film piece was really an extension. It, it didn't come to life until the very end. So again, like the partnership originated based on, you know, sort of brand values, mission, and figure out how do we continue to like tell stories and how do we sort of continue to impact our creators, who is our, our core constituency. So the program, actually, our partnership with Chiquel Knight stemmed from our Creators for BIPOC initiative, which was really our way to sort of activate the creator community to address barriers faced by BIPOC creators. And again, this was 2021, 2022, where there was just a lot of conversation around it. And it felt to us like there wasn't, there was a lot of talk, but there was not a lot of action. And so we found Jaquel and loved his story. For those who don't know, Jaquel is the first commercial choreographer to own his own copyright. He is the choreographer beyond, behind Beyonce's Single Ladies, Megan Stallion. So pretty iconic. And for him, unlike a painter who paints something and, okay, that you own that IP, or a singer or songwriter who writes a song, okay, you own that. When it comes to choreography and dance, it's a little bit different. You mm -hmm. are work for hire. You don't necessarily own the work that you've created. And so Jaquel and his, through and his team, you know, really went on a limb and sort of changed the game and sort of changed what's possible for not just choreographers, but the next Jaquel Knights, the next sort of creators and being able to be properly recognized for the work that you do and also have some ownership of it. Because I think ownership at the end of the day is one of the most important things that, that we can have in anything we do. Home ownership, ownership in our relationships and stuff, but as well as in our work. So we initially started the partnership with a way to help the next Jaquels. We decided to help 10 up and coming creators own their own copyright to the dance moves that they've created that ultimately went viral on TikTok. And so that was a partnership that everybody was really excited about that felt native to us, organic to Jaquel. And then the more that we sort of uncovered the story and the process, we're like, there's a film here. Dave, there's a bigger story here. And wow. fortunately, Jaquel felt the same. This is not a feature, it was a short film. Oh, and, sorry. and we went, uh, it's okay. Oh, maybe one day it will be a feature. Uh, <laughs> we'll short. I, think, I think we have enough footage to actually make it a feature. We sort of went, you know, as a partnership, like how do we bring this to life? And hand in hand together over the course of the year, we developed it. We brought in a great partner in Westbrook to help us bring this film to life. And yeah, to your point, like you wouldn't think of a film organically as part of your like content output strategy. But again, like this felt very consistent with our brands. There was a lot of alignment for, with our mission and our values. And I think there was just a lot of love for what Jaquel was doing and wanting to continue to support him in a way that can hopefully elevate his, not just his standing, but his mission as well. And yeah, this was, it was just a great experience. The brand super low touch. There wasn't, you know, a ton of product integration, which was in completely intentional. And the response has been really amazing. We, you know, won a couple of awards at film festivals. We'll be at Brand Storytelling at Sundance next month with the film as well. And, you know, I just think that while this isn't necessarily, it's not a new thing, like, you know, brands like Nike, Patagonia, Chipotle, like brands that you think about, iconic brands, that have sort of built that cultural connection, they've been doing this. They've had some really great success in many different ways. I remember back in the early 2000s, BMW had those great films with Clive Owen. So like, this is not new, but I just think it's a little bit forgotten or it's because it doesn't feel transactional sometimes or it doesn't feel like the product is leading the brand. It really feels like the brand is leading the brand. Yeah. And it was a really great experience and hopefully, you know, one that we can, you know, one day do again. That's awesome. It's really cool to hear how it evolved in collaboration between the two of you guys from something that like, you know, just kept growing and growing and growing and like got more and more special and isn't frankly done, right? I don't think it's finished. So I think the last kind of a little bit more fun question, not that everything hasn't been fun, but, you know, on the concept of VR, you know, VR also had a moment and I think has it slowed down, but I think the recent stuff that you've seen Zuckerberg come around with where it's like, can literally see the other person. It looks quite wild. Yeah, I'm curious as a, a fan of technology and as somebody that sits in that space, you know, where do you think that's going? Where do you, what do you think the future of that is? Uh, hopefully you, um, you can hear that deep breath over the microphone. It's, not just, <laughs> it's a blue mic, so you should be able to hear it. It's a great question. So full disclosure, I've sort of given up on predictions after like 2011. I wrote a Jeremy Moore. <laughs> memo that Google Plus is going to change the whole game and like, you know, we should delete our face bugs and just our whole strategy should go on Google Plus. So I've retired, <laughs> so take everything I say with a grain of salt. 
you know, I'm just constantly surprised. I think the, I don't know where it's going or how this ends. Yeah. I am constantly surprised. So at the, um, at the speed of the innovation, and when it seems like, you know, I worked in VR in 2016, 2017 through 2018, actually. And it felt at that time, like there was going to be this holy S moment where like, all right, now that we can put a phone in a headset that everyone's going to want to do it. And like, that just wasn't the case. We never had our iPhone moment. We never had sort of like, what is the Netflix house of cards moment for VR? Yeah. Like, the experience that everybody needs to go see. But, you know, I think there was a lot done then that really allowed us to be where we are today. So I am... I don't know where this goes. I do think that, you know, the advancements on the meta front, the fact that it's not just an isolating experience, which I think from even somebody who worked in VR was just a constant pain point. Like I, I want to still connect with the outside world. So I think mm -hmm. going into that mixed reality direction, I think big wait and see moment with Apple as well with their headset when they come yeah. out cool to see what, how people respond. Because typically if you look at, you know, previous indicators, Apple is really the, the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of like they introduce a product and for the most part, that's what takes it mainstream. Yeah. And I think then this idea of if that happens, rising yeah. tide, rising tide <laughs> and so I think like there isn't going to necessarily be one winner. I think it will be an amazing sort of achievement if all of these sort of companies, like little startups like Meta and Apple then kind of can succeed together. And I'm, I think that is ultimately what's going to sort of take the mainstream sort of have find mainstreaming success is one of these sort of transcending and then sort of this mixed reality component as well. Not to mention like, you know, the role AI will play in that as well. Like it's, oh yeah, it hurts your head sometimes to think, at least my head, I mean, head, like, the, yep. there's a lot that's going on in here, but it hurts your head sometimes to think about like all these different, you know, how quickly things are going to change. Like we can have this conversation again in two years and I think our minds will be blown at sort of what we're seeing and what we're experiencing, how quickly things have expanded and shifted. And again, I'm hoping it's all for for the better and for the good. And I believe that will be the case, but it, it just, yeah, it's, it kind of hurts your head to think about how quickly things can change and are changing. Yeah, the rate at which technology is progressing is is wild and not, not going to slow down. Let me ask you, turn the tables for a second. What do you think? Oh, man. I think you're right in terms of VR being a little bit isolating, right? Because you kind of put it on, you lose sight of the rest of the world. It is a shocking experience. It like is weird how much your body kind of takes it as truth, right? Like even though it's not, like it's still only pretty, it's still pretty early in the, the scheme of things. And so I remember putting my headset on my son, who was like three at the time. And he like, it was like a building. So it looked like you were going to fall and he like dove to the ground because he thought like he was going to yeah. die, One right? Those, that was on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Like people who just take it a little to, to the neck, to the hedge. Yeah. And so you do that. I think the, like you said, I think that Apple is the real, you know, that's where it could open up pretty significantly. And I think their approach of kind of more the mixed reality where it's like, I can see but I can also have essentially virtual screens or virtual information laid out on top yeah. of the real world is interesting. Obviously, it's not something that I think like, would I wear that walking around? Probably not, right? So the other one that's pretty interesting is, did you see Humane, H-U-M-A-N-E? I don't think I've seen that one. So I can't remember the guy's exact heritage. I think he was like the head of Google X, right? The experimental division. But it's like a pin you put on your shirt. And it oh, is... Oh, I did see that. I did yeah, see yeah, that. yeah. So I, there's a bunch of innovation happening. Which one's going to break through? Yeah. Um, the, I don't the know. The likelihood is that the, the winner might not exist yet. You know, yeah. like, you think it's Apple, you think it's Meta, just because, and if you're a betting person, you probably bet on them. But there's an argument to be made that the humane example, like there's a garage somewhere, you know, in, <laughs> you know, in your part of the woods that is just building, you know, doing something that is just going to completely just revolutionize. Because I think to your point, you know, I'll eat my words in a couple of years, but I don't see us taking the six train in New York and having the head tech, but maybe, but I think there's something else that is just going to come along that's really going to shock and surprise and really maybe be the thing. I think that's what history has shown us with other stuff. So could 100%. be. Well, David, I really appreciate you taking out the time and glad we finally got to do this. Yes, me too. Wishing you a great holiday season. Yeah, and I'll see you down in LA or up here soon. That would be great. Thanks again for having me. Be a friend, tell a friend, and subscribe. Earned by Creator IQ. Creator IQ is your all-in-one solution to grow, manage, scale, and measure your influencer marketing program. Ready to unlock the power of the creator economy? Get started with a demo today at creatoriq.com.